If you've ever thought of quilting your own projects but just don't know where to start, I have the perfect first steps for you. I've put together a PDF guide. I call it Three Steps Toward Freehand Freedom. These are the baby steps, but they can help you move past your overwhelm and show you that, yes, indeed, freehand quilting can be learned. So if you'd like to snag this PDF, there's a link in the show notes, or if you're an Instagram user, just message me three steps. That's the number three, S-T-E-P-S, and I'll send you that link. Let today be the day you get started. I give all my energy to whatever I do. So I try to find a way to help support my family, but also be able to be there for my child. Welcome to Measure Twice, Cut Once, the podcast where we hear quilters and other crafters stories and draw encouragement and even life lessons from them. I'm your host, Susan Smith, coming to you from my quilting studio, Stitched by Susan. This is where my long arm, Lucy, and I spend lots of hours doing freehand, edge-to-edge quilting. Now, if you're not a quilter and unfamiliar with those terms, it's basically doodling on a quilt top with a 50-pound pencil with needle and thread attached at really high speeds. My philosophy is there's nothing as warm and comforting as a handmade quilt, and my mission is to get as many out in the world as possible. So I quilt for people, and I teach others to find freedom and joy in quilting for themselves. There are so many quilt makers and just as many stories. Quilting has been a bridge between generations, it has soothed loneliness and chronic pain, and it's been a beautiful expression of art and creativity that spans countries and cultures. Joining me today is Tori McElwain. Today's Pins and Needles is brought to you by The Will and Dave Show. Hi, I'm the Will Half of The Will and Dave Show, a short little podcast that myself and the eponymous Dave like to record talking about the things that really matter to us, whether that's social, political, or pop culture. Usually we don't see eye to eye, but more often than not, we can find some common ground in there somewhere. And now, back to pins and needles with a quick tip for all you sharp quilters out there. To remind myself to have regular cleaning and spa sessions for my sewing machine, I like to pre-wind bobbins, and that's kind of like my built-in alarm clock. So... I tend to sew with neutral thread colors, so I often use the same color bobbins repeatedly. Sew in my preferred little neutral um, parchment colored thread. I usually preload six or seven bobbins, and when I'm through those bobbins, I stop. Take a few minutes to open up the presser plate of your sewing machine to clean the lint out of it. I use a fuzzy, well-worn craft brush for that and just swirl it around and pull out all the lint. Lift out the bobbin casing, do the same type of cleaning in that. If you have a tiny attachment for your vacuum cleaner, you can even pull some of that lint out of the base of your sewing machine. What you don't want to do is use any kind of compressor or canned air and force that lint back into the machine. You always want to be drawing it out. So do a good cleaning up of the lint. If you oil your machine, it's a good time to put in a drop or two of oil. And then you're ready to go again. It's just a very simple couple minute cleaning session. And then once again, load a fresh batch of bobbins and set your clock for the next spa day. You all know I love my coffee. And if you're interested in supporting this podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan, where for the price of one delicious coffee, you're able to make a one-time contribution. This helps me keep batteries in stock for my microphone and enables me to keep bringing you these weekly episodes. Thanks so much for your support and maybe take a moment now to refill your cup as you settle back to enjoy today's interview. Now, Tori's been a quilter for over 20 years. She's a mom and a dog mom. She loves very much to travel, and her husband is currently serving in the U.S. Army. 
Tori has a master's in curriculum and instruction, and she brings that love of teaching to her pattern design and also to her online courses and lectures that she offers. So I'm really looking forward to our chat with Tori today. This is such great fun to get to visit together with other quilters, even though it's just virtual. So Tori, you have a long history in quilting. You've been making quilts for a long time, haven't you? Yes, I've been quilting since I was nine. Oh, wow. It's about 21 years now. Okay, so did you come from a family of quilt makers? Did you see quilts being made around you? Um, I grew up with my grandma having quilts, um, and she did make some, but I never really got to see her process. Whenever we would go spend the night at her house, we would make our beds out of antique quilts and family heirlooms. So I've always grown up around them. And then my mom got really interested in quilting when I was around 10 or 11. And I made my very first quilt with some help with a family friend um, who was a really avid quilter, and she taught me the basics. How fun. So, of course, 20 plus years ago, you said over 20 years, I would guess YouTube, you know, instructional videos were not as thick on the ground as they are now. Nowadays, when you want to learn how to make a quilt, you can just, you know, find a quilter that suits your personal teaching style and away you go. So where did you set about learning then to make a quilt? Well, the first quilt that I made completely on my own, I was probably about 11 or 12, and I wanted to make a rag quilt. Mm -hmm. So my mom is a quilter, but her teaching style and my learning style don't really mesh. So I, she kind of guided me on what to do next, and I had to kind of figure it out on my own uh, with a rag quilt. Because, you know, you just take like two pieces of flannel with batting in between, you quilt them, then you sew them together. And then you cut the fringe, or I call it the rag. So you kind of make, if I'm remembering correctly, you kind of put the seam allowances on the top, on the right side, right? And then you make all these little snips and then wash it. And that's what makes the rag effect is those edges all curl up and fray then, right? Right. Got it. I had to figure that out on my own. So I ended up throwing in a neon green polyester fur because I just really wanted it. And it didn't make a, a great rag, True. Um, but it was really soft and fun. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, though, any given fabric, while it might not make a great quilt, will always make a great Am I right? I bet you've told this story a lot of times since then anyway. I have. I think it's a great uh, starting quilt story because you don't have to have the perfect fabric. You can choose what you want and work with what you have. Absolutely true. And one of my longest lived quilts is one that my mom made back in probably the 70s or thereabouts when sort of double knit polyester fabric was all the thing. You remember the polyester pantsuits? Well, anyway, she made a whole quilt out of those squares. And, you know, it's 50 plus years old now and it will never die. Anyway, so on to quilt stories. So you've made your first quilt. At what point in there did someone start saying to you or did you figure out how important pressing is? Well, I actually, the next quilt I really make, so I did a few sewing projects between that when I was 10 and then about when I was 17 is when I made my next one for my then boyfriend. So I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, so what I did was put this quilt together as quickly as I could. I'm using just the pattern. And I thought to myself, like, I don't even have time to press. I don't know why we need to press. And it came together pretty well. Uh, but my, And I asked my mom to long arm it because at that point she had her long arm. And she, and that's what she loves to do is long arming. Um, and she told me that she wouldn't be able to long arm it until she pressed it. So she was over there pressing it while I was studying, I think for like finals or something. And she's mumbling the whole time. And then she told me the next quilt you give me better be pressed. <laughs> that's funny. So did you, did you branch in that period of time into sewing other things like garments and other types of sewing or was just quilt making your love already? I didn't really have time. I was a very busy, you know, teenager, and then I joined, and then I went to college, so I wasn't able to bring a lot of things with me. But I always had an interested an interest in learning. I actually just joined a membership to learn. Uh, it's geared toward quilters to make garments. Oh, okay. So I'm really excited about that, and that's from um, Sewing Squares. Okay, sure and it is. It. Having done both myself, they're two really different skills. So, you know, those who love working with fabric, though, might like doing the both things for sure. Right. All right. So you come from a background in teaching. Am I right? So is is that kind of your first love or is the hobby, the craft, your first love? Because now you teach. 
quilt making. I do. I do. Uh, teaching is my first love. I've known I've wanted to be a teacher since I was probably around seven. I was a Girl Scout. I was a Girl Scout for 13 years from awesome. Daisy to senior. I have a gold award, everything. Um, but I did a lot of teaching inside Girl Scouts when it comes with um, you know, younger girls. And I remember being just a little older than a Daisy and Daisies are five years old. So I was probably around seven um, when I was first taught uh, these daisies how to say the Girl Scout promise. Awesome. And I remember seeing them. The next time I saw them, one of the girls came running up to me from across the room and gave me a big hug, and then immediately starts reciting the Girl Scout promise. And she was so proud of herself. And I was just like, in that moment, I knew that's what I wanted to do was inspire students and teach. It was just an amazing little moment for a seven year old to just be like, I taught her that. Look how proud she is. No kidding. So rewarding. I love that story. That's great. So you make quilts. At some point you, I don't know if you transitioned or you just added the fact that you also long arm, right? And you do that for other people or just for yourself? I do it for other people. I also love to do it for myself. Um, it's a very creative process for me and it's something that I keep local. Um, as you know, I am a active duty spouse. So my husband's in the army and we move all the time. So where we currently are right now is Arizona, and we've been here for a little over two years. And I was fortunate enough to be trained on the long arm at our local quilt shop. So she actually nice. rents out the, the long arm there, so I don't actually have to have it in my house, which as an army spouse is great because we don't have the space or the, you know, we move. Um, so it's been great to learn it and be creative on it. And I've really been enjoying learning uh, free motion quilting on the long arm. That's actually, I feel like, a really good tip for people who are interested in quilting for themselves is that does not necessarily, the next step is not necessarily buying your own long arm, right? There are other ways that you can enjoy that and learn that skill without necessarily the investment in a huge long arm of your own. So consider local shops that will not only train you, but rent a machine to you too. Yes. Good point. So you have kind of... Um, grown your business of teaching people did this come about just because of your love of teaching and you always wanted to do that or were there other factors that kind of nudged you into growing your teaching business well i so i went to school to be a teacher i majored in history as my ba and a minor with child development because i didn't know if i wanted to be high school or elementary teacher right. so i did study a lot of um education and then my husband decided he wanted to join the army two weeks after we got married. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So we moved sh shortly after that. He went to basic training for six months and then I moved from California to Georgia. <laughs> I drove across country, um, me and my dog to go move into a one bedroom apartment with him. So I wasn't able to get my teaching credential until we settled in our first permanent duty station and permanent meaning we're only there for like three to four years. <laughs> and that was Texas. So when we moved to Texas, I got my master's degree in curriculum and instruction alongside my Texas teaching certification. Okay. I got to dive deep into the science of education, which was mm -hmm. really cool. And then I started teaching kindergarten. So I was, in the, I was in the school system for three years, the first year as an aide and two years as a kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. And then I had my son. And it's kind of a long, a long way around to where I am right now, but I feel like it's important to show where I started and why I'm here. <laughs> but I had my son and I realized I was so burnt out in the school system just after being in it for three years that I was afraid I couldn't be there for my child. Mm -hmm. um, I give all my energy to whatever I do. So I try to find a way to help support my family, but also be able to be there for my child. And then, of course, or after I had him, three months later, we moved again. So, so changes, there, changes on every front. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so from there, I'm realizing all of this. And we're only at that duty station. So we moved from Texas to South Carolina for training. So we were only there for about seven to eight months. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started making quilts to sell because that was a skill I had and something I could do while my son slept because I was one of those lucky people who had a baby who would sleep. 
You are very lucky. Yes. Uh, he didn't sleep when he turned two, but before he was two, he slept great. <laughs> so um, that's where I started. And then I started uh, doing individual lessons for friends. And that's when I realized I could probably make this into an even bigger opportunity. So develop it into your skills in teaching along with your crafting skills and combine those two. Great exactly. thinking. And so that's where I'm at now. I am I started a year ago with online classes and then in-person classes at my local quilt shop. And now I'm able, I've been reaching out to guilds and starting to book a few guild events. So it's been really exciting. I've been, gone, I've been getting a lot of good feedback from my students and I'm still developing some of my own um, courses and guild programs. Right. Uh, one I'm really interested in right now is movement and quilting, <laughs> which is all about how your eye moves around a quilt and the different ways you can style that. So more referring to movement in terms of the quilt design. When you say quilting, I'm thinking of the long arming because that's where my head goes. So you mean more in terms of the design, right, of the quilt? Well, there's four elements. Okay. Um, one is the actual pattern pieces themselves. Okay. The other one is the fabric when it comes to solids, patterns, textures. Um, the third is color. And I am a color certified teacher in Shannon Brinkley's Color Confidence for Quilters course. I'm also teaching that. And then the last one is quilting. <laughs> Ah, okay. Now I'm following. So you're teaching all those aspects then of how all those work together to help yes. your eye move around a quilt and enjoy the yes, whole exactly. thing. And that way you can take the pattern that you love and really put in your own personal preference into it. I love that. Those are great points. Now you're making me want to run and sign up for some of your online courses. So we'll be sure to put, listeners, we'll put links in the show notes for those sorts of things so you can find Tori's um, online classes, sessions, and guild offerings and all those things. Well, that's really neat. That sounds like you have a very holistic approach to quilt making. So you're not really focused on just one aspect of it, but you can really help um, a quilter, and especially a quilter who's at the beginning stages, know how to pull this all together. There is so much. There's so many levels to making a quilt. It can be very bewildering, I feel like. And so I love that you're teaching from all those different angles. That's great. One of my favorite phrases that I learned um, working at my elementary school was creating a positive, challenging environment. So it's not only positive, but also challenges your skills. And that's something I brought into my quilting classes. It's something to kind of challenge your thinking, but also help you build skills and give you those basics so that you can build a quilt that you love. Yes. So it's it's easy to keep doing the thing you already know how to do, but it's way more rewarding, isn't it? To actually put a challenge in front of yourself and master it. Yes. Love that. Okay. So I want to talk just a little bit about your online course development because it's the thing that I delve into as well. So it really interests me. How do you kind of convert from, from teaching in person, you know, one-on-one -on -one to seeing a person's face, how do you convert that into a pre-recorded course and have the same interaction and flow in that? Do you have any tips for that? So because I started in 2020, we, the only option we had was virtual. Right. So I started with live classes and any live class that I have that's pre-recorded or I'm sorry, any pre-recorded classes I have are live classes that I did first. Okay. So you'll always see me, you'll see usually only me. Maybe by the end, if um, we do a block of the month, and then sometimes I have people sharing, but I ask their permission before I share the whole screen. <laughs> but usually in any pre recorded classes, there is a hidden audience of at least two people. <laughs> okay. So that they can give me feedback as we go and make sure that I am natural because I can't talk to a computer screen naturally. Uh, well, I'm getting better, I should say. I'm getting better, but it's much easier to have a live class and then record it, edit it a little bit. Um, so if there's any, you know, any internet mistakes or anything like that, you can easily put it together and make it flow well, really nicely, and then um, offer that. That's excellent, actually, because it does, as you say, that totally helps you create the interaction within your talking even if the students are not speaking on screen you still have that relation going on got it got it that Those makes more perfect natural. sense yep so 
you mentioned a number of the different courses that you teach. Um, what are the things do you do? I read that you were making a lot of masks too at the beginning of the pandemic. Is that something that you um, were involved in like designing them or just making for family and friends? What did that look like for you? Well, I started it by offering, I voluntarily ran, ran a play group for zero to three year olds when I first moved here. I threw it together because I couldn't find an informal play group where we could just meet up two days a week and have fun outside. So let me just insert here for a second. You were talking about your son as an infant. How old is he now? He just turned three. Oh, okay. So you've got a toddler at home. Yes. So that's the age group you're working with right now. Got it. (laughs) Okay. So on with your story. Yeah. He just turned three and now he's in a daycare slash preschool. Okay. Uh, Because during the pandemic, we didn't really have a chance to get him socialized. So that's one yeah, that's one big thing I really wanted for him. But um, that's also why I started the playgroup. And then within that playgroup, I went ahead and offered masks when it became mandatory. And it blew up almost overnight where I just did it. I just made masks for donations. I had such generous neighbors and army spouses bringing me fabric and donations and just trading me. And all I did was I would sew them at home using my stash for the most part. And I would leave them on the black table outside my door and they would come and they would, if they wanted to donate, I would thank them and they would just stick something under a rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we had a, an issue locally where the soldiers had to have masks, but they can only have masks in certain colors. Interesting. Um, I, that never occurred to me. So one of my favorite fabrics is Kona Black black Kona. And I had a ton of it. And that was one of the colors that soldiers could have. So I was making, I made hundreds of black masks just for the local soldiers. And I would just, again, leave them outside and they would come pick it up. And usually they would ask for their wife to have one or their child to have one. And so that's what I did. And it just built up. And then by the end of the pandemic, I had gotten two fitted order masks Okay. And that was my biggest order. And then I was done. And all I asked them for was to pay for the materials. I did all the labor for free. And it was for a middle school that one of my friends worked at um, that actually went to middle school, which was funny. Um, But then I was done. I made 998 masks and I was burnt out. I was just going to ask that. What was the tally when you got to the end? 998. Amazing. Thank you. I, I couldn't make two more. I get that question every once in a while. I, I just, I can't. <laughs> yeah, no, I can see that. I'm all admiration. And it's funny, actually, that you would bring this up today, because I actually have a quilt on my long arm today, just inserting one of my own stories here, from a friend who made a lot of masks. And she did a similar thing. She has a long driveway, so she had a bin at the end of her driveway, free masks, you know, donation or whatever. And she just, the honor system, people could pick up a mask if they wanted to, leave money or not if they didn't want to. Anyway, this quilt that I've got now is all the same fabrics that she made masks from. So she calls it her mask quilt. Um, And so it's just fascinating. There's no rhyme or reason to the matching of the prints or the colors or anything like that. It's just going to be a complete sort of memory quilt of all the masks that she's made. And so I think there's probably a lot of people throughout this pandemic who one way or another have worked out their frustrations or, you know, sewed their memories into a quilt. That's a beautiful thing to do. It kind of is. And it makes you wonder throughout history what kinds of things quilt makers have sewn into their projects, you know, whether it's their grief or whether it's their celebration that quilts hold those memories for them. You also, you love to travel. Hopefully you love to move too, because that's kind of important (laughs) in your lifestyle. (laughs) What are some of the fun places you've traveled? Uh, France is top of the list. Uh, I did that in college, I had a friend studying abroad over there and I saved up for a year. And this is right before the, the ticket skyrocketed, um, back in, oh, I want to say 2011. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. I got to travel all over Northern France. I went to the beaches of Normandy and the big World War II museum they had there. And we went to uh, the castle Saint-Michel. Yes. Which is on a, um, what do you call it? Sand. 
On a dune? A quicksand beach. On a quicksand beach? I've never and heard I of never, such a thing. I never got the sand out of my shoes. <laughs> so, so how does a castle reside on a quicksand beach? Give me a quick lesson here. Now, this was 10 years ago. So if I remember correctly, they had to rebuild it three times. The first two sunk and they built the third one on top and it stayed. So one wonders why in the world they built it there. Do you know? It was some kind of vantage point, And I think the monarch or the lord who had the castle wanted some kind of, you know, stake. Like, ha, I did it kind of thing. Interesting. <sighs> kind of like Napoleon III with his gigantic palace. <laughs> Interesting. So I grew up in a kind of pioneering family and we built you know, driveways and roads to some of the places we grew up on. And we called them corduroy roads where you would lay logs like corduroy in, you know, quick sandy type areas. So they did the same thing, but with castles. That's a bit pricey, one would think. Oh, yeah. And I don't remember if I'm, I'm remembering that correctly. It's something definitely to look up, but it's an interesting story. I do remember it being very interesting. And it was a beautiful castle. If you've ever seen Harry Potter, it was a lot like Diagon Alley. Nice. So where else have you traveled? Uh, we've traveled all over the country. We've lived in Georgia, South Carolina, Texas, Arizona, and I'm originally from California. And I've traveled all over the West Coast from Washington to Oregon, obviously all over California. Um, me and my sister actually took our 30th birthday trip um, to Seattle just because we'd never been there. That's awesome. So you, are, awesome. you are a twin, is that correct? Yes, I am a twin. <laughs> So when you say we, it often refers to sort of your sidekick. Yes, I, I'm always a we. I'm a we with my sister. I'm a we with my son or with my husband. I'm always That's a awesome. We. That's awesome. Well, this has been so fun, Tori. But I do have one more question before we go. And I forewarned you this was coming. I kind of like to ask my guests, what's your one big takeaway? And it honestly doesn't have to be big. But is there something that you especially love that quilting has brought into your life or enriched your life with or some lesson that you've learned or some tough season that quilting has carried you through? Oh, man, I have answers for all of those. But um... well, give, give it to us. Lay it on us. And my biggest life lesson that quilting has taught me is to really jump in and just figure out the one next step that you need. Because I've jumped into college. I've jumped into a master's program. My husband and I jumped into the army life. I jumped into quilting several times throughout my childhood and then stuck with it as a young adult. And then just figuring out the next step as you go. It's a really, it's a big learning process, but it is exciting and it can bring out a lot of new opportunities. I think that's excellent advice. And paraphrased, you know, you don't have to know how to do it before you start. Am I right? Exactly. Just exactly. start. That's wonderful. And this is what I love to hear because every quilter has a different story of how quilting has enriched life for them. And I have so appreciated hearing yours. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This has been really fun. And thank you for tuning into the show. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider taking a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcast or the podcast app of your choice. It really helps other listeners to find the show so they can hear these stories too. For information on the classes I offer or quilting services, please see my website, stitchedbysusan.com. If you're a long-arm quilter and looking for freehand tips, take advantage of the live and unscripted events hosted on my Facebook page and replayed on my YouTube channel, Stitched by Susan. And if pictures are your preference, check out my Pinterest galleries of edge-to-edge -edge and custom quilting projects. These direct links can all be found in the show notes below. So, until next time, may your sorrows be patched and your joys be quilted. <laughs>